Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome today to the InnovaBuzz podcast, all the way from Massachusetts in the USA, Alan Lazaros, who's the CEO of Next Level University podcast, a global top 100 podcast with over 1,600 episodes and listened to in over 150 countries. Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Alan. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you for having me. It is an honor. I researched your show. You've been going for quite some time. I know that you're past 600 now, which is wild. I yeah. know what that's like. And so I appreciate it. It's an absolute honor. Thank you. Yeah, well, 600 kind of pales into insignificance to 1600. And uh, I know when we had our initial conversation, you talked about um, just doing one every day and aiming to be 1% better on each episode. And you're all about peak performance, optimizing performance, and and also personalizing that optimum performance, which is a fascinating concept that I'd love to dig into some more today. But before we do that, what's the impact you're hoping to make in the world today, Alan? Yeah, the impact I'm hoping to make is is a refocusing on self improvement. As in my opinion, I do believe that self-improvement is the least selfish thing you can do. And if all of us focus on self-improvement, I think we'll all be more fulfilled. And if we're all more fulfilled, I think fulfilled people don't want to hurt people. Fulfilled people don't tear people down. Fulfilled people just want to see other people more fulfilled. And I think that self-improvement is the way. So uh, specifically holistic self-improvement, which I know we'll get into. So that's the impact that I want to have is hopefully a a refocusing of everyone's attention back into improving the self, because when you improve the self, everyone around you also improves. Mm, yeah, it's a, a leadership principle, isn't it? And I love that you highlighted that if we focus on self-improvement, if we focus on being the best we can be and continually improving that, that um, we're really looking to see everyone improve and it's not a case of, I can see you, Alan, and I think you should do this different or I think you should do this, this different. So picking something that that I might think you should do different, it's more about um, the focus on me and what I can influence by myself and then being joyful and being supportive of your endeavours to improve rather than, as you say, bringing people down. Uh, which would be the former, right? To say, hey, I didn't like what you were doing there. Yeah, I think that that's the difference between projecting onto others your own beliefs versus living in curiosity and living in the the duality of I have my philosophy and my beliefs and I'm building my building, so to speak, my castle. And my castle can be different than your castle and we can agree to disagree on the way in which we do things, but I'm still going to do things the way that I believe is optimal. And hopefully that will make the world a better place. And, and ultimately I think that's, that's the win, win, win scenario that we all can play from versus the, the old sort of dogmatic view that in order for me to win, you have to lose. Yeah. Yeah. That, that win, lose mentality is uh, so destructive and also it, it ultimately you don't actually win. I think you know there's there's so many examples where perhaps you do in the short term, but in the long term it's actually more destructive for self as well as um, the losing of the other person that you think is benefiting you. Hundred percent, and that's the mm. the difference between a finite game and an infinite game, and focusing on short-term gain to someone else's detriment actually ends up being your ultimate detriment because then you're not fulfilled or proud of who you've become. Hmm. All right. Now you talked about um, holistic self-improvement. So what does that mean to you and and how does that play into your coaching and into the podcast that you do? Holistic is the idea that you do not want to be just really successful in any one narrow area. So growing up, I always looked around and there were some people who did really well economically, but they, you know, their relationship wasn't great. Hmm. 
uh, there were some people that were really maybe in great shape, but they're, they weren't uh, successful in the economy. I have one friend in particular who's in great shape. Look, dude looks like a superhero. He's super capable and he always dialed in his fitness. He's in such good shape, enviable shape, but he never took his career ser- seriously. And because mm-hmm. of that, he is kind of trapped by that. And so, you know, I have some millionaire mentors that take better care of their Porsche than they do of their own family. And I, I just, <laughs> I think that's a, it's a, we're all a warning and an example. Yeah. All of us are. And I think it's a warning. I think the warning is, hey, don't be really successful in only one narrow area, because if that's the case, you probably won't be fulfilled. And again, that's what comes back to that fulfillment piece of, I have been very wealthy while not healthy, and that wasn't good. I've also been, and by wealthy, I mean my income was very high. Hmm. Uh, And then I've been healthy but miserable and alone when I was doing fitness competitions and didn't really uh, hang out with anyone in my social circles and, and didn't have an intimate relationship, at least not a good one. And now I w- I'm proud to say that I'm holistically successful, healthy, wealthy, and in love. And by healthy, I, I'm a little nasally right now, so yeah, I've yeah. got a pretty, pretty, pretty tough cold right now. But I was just telling you before this, I spent the last nine years without getting sick. And the reason why is because I actually prioritized my health. And before that, I never did. Uh, I had a car accident at 26 that was that sort of my quarter life crisis. And before that, I was I was focused on my career and achievement, but I wasn't focused on my health. And I was focused on relationships, friendships, corporate, you know, colleagues and, and high school friends and college friends, but I wasn't focused on my intimate relationship and, and that flourishing. So I always try to try to say you got to be healthy, wealthy and in love. And, and I think of it like a pyramid. The bottom mm-hmm. of the pyramid is health because without the health, everything else falls. Yeah. Uh, then the next level is actually wealth, I think, and then love. And the reason why is because the number one reason why uh, relationships, intimate relationships fail, if you Google that, it it's almost always money problems. And mm. and underneath that is just the stress that comes with money problems and, and the inability to re- resolve conflict. But if you are healthy and you are financially abundant, most likely you are setting yourself up for more success in an intimate relationship, but not necessarily true if you're building that wealth by no emotional intelligence and just grinding yeah. in in your workaholic nature. So it, again, the key is holistic and um, mm. yeah. Yeah, because I think there's plenty of examples of hugely successful um, entrepreneurs, we won't name names, who've... Um, had many failed marriages and um, just from the outside, I'm guessing that their uh, their intimate relationships are uh, flawed. I would say that's most likely true. <laughs> and yeah, we won't name any names, but I think we can all think of a couple, you know, and yeah, I do want to share this. I, I, I admire a lot of what Steve Jobs accomplished, but the, the truth of the matter is, and he was a hero of mine for a long time. Hmm. And he still is in some ways, but he wasn't holistic. And and hmm. that's very clear to anyone who studies his life. Uh, just didn't take his health super seriously. And it, hmm. it's that became very apparent in his 50s. And um, in some ways, I think that, yeah, might have gotten him killed. But to me, I, I think it's important to be holistic. I really do. But remember, and this is the, the last piece I'll share about the holistic thing. If you want to be one in a hundred healthy and then one in a hundred wealthy and then one in a hundred in love, that's one in a hundred times one in a hundred times one in a hundred. So a hundred times a hundred is a thousand times a hundred is 10,000. So you're going to be one in 10,000. So statistically speaking, it's very difficult. It's just very difficult to be healthy, wealthy, and in love. It really is. It's why it's so rare. It's so rare. As, as a kid, I would look around and it never made sense. Why does it seem like no one is holistically fulfilled? I mean, mm. I, I have wealthy people I can think of right now that, that have multiple mansions and I've been there and then they're, the person I'm thinking of is a great guy. But he didn't take his health seriously ever. He never exercised consistently, 
right? And I just, I couldn't imagine that. To me, that makes no sense. There were phases in my life where I wasn't exercising either. So I, I've been there too. But to go 50 some odd years without taking your health seriously just seems like such a massive oversight, especially for someone who's so smart. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It's like if you're yeah. really rational and intelligent. That's- it's yeah, fascinating, yeah. isn't it? I mean, I I was um, I was never a sport. I was a nerd when I was a kid, and I was never a sporting Same. kid. So I had, <clears throat> you know, I had two left feet. Somebody threw a ball at me. There was a, sort of ninety nine times out of a hundred, I couldn't possibly even catch it or anything. But I was always physically very active. And um, at some point, I discovered that I could actually play um, what you know as soccer. We call it football. Um, at a you know, reasonably good amateur level, and and I really loved it. So and I loved the strategy behind it and everything. So that that was my outlet. And then I discovered bike riding. And ever since then, that's been my outlet. And and now, um, you know, I've been exercising regularly for uh, well over fifty years, getting on probably over sixty years. And um, it's just it's just a thing I do every day, and I still enjoy it. I still love it, and I still sort of vary it in different. I do different things, but as you say, there were a, there was a time in my life where I didn't do regular exercise, and I did pack on a little bit of weight. And it was around the time when my kids were young, so I was spending any spare time I had with kids. And it was also early on in my corporate career. So I was very focused on um, establishing myself in, in the positions I was in and, and learning enough to advance myself and improve my financial situation. Um, so there, there are times in our lives, right, where, where the balance shifts and the focus goes into one area or another area. Uh, but we have to be careful that we're aware that we're neglecting one thing. Um, so sometimes I knew I was neglecting my relationship with my partner because um, I would come home from long overseas trips. I would have been away for a long time and she would complain because I was away and she had to do all these things with the kids without any support. So I would focus on um, taking up taking the load off her in some way but at the same time whilst that was really helpful for her it kind of meant that I didn't actually spend any one-on-one time with her um, which had been missing before as well so there's those times where the balance shifts right for whatever reason Um, and so what's your advice to first of all being aware that hey I'm shifting the balance and I need to know that that is what I want to do um, right now and the reasons for doing that as opposed to it's just happening because I'm not paying attention and also how do we then make an adjustment again? I think I've been, I'm reading a book right now called The Art of Focus by Dan Coe and it's, I think it's going to be in my top 10 books, which is saying Mm -hmm. a lot because I just adore, I adore, I adore books and I adore this book in particular. It's blowing my mind. But I was thinking about this the other day, you know, cause I'm overwhelmed right now. We have an event in nine days, um, 21 person team, 21 departments. Uh, we produce 50 podcasts and three of which are mine. And I'm doing eight episodes a week. If you include my other podcast, The Conscious Couples Podcast, plus Next Level University. And then I just started another one called Next Level Audio Blog. And I, I'm not saying that to complain because all of those were my choice. And they're, they're what I want to do. And it's deeply meaningful work that I think is really important. So that's not a complaint. That's more of just calling a spade a spade. This is what it is. But I'm overwhelmed. And I've been thinking a lot lately about the question you just asked me, which is how do you manage it all? How do you how do you, especially when I get sick, I got sick. So Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there going, how am I going to sustain all this? And the only thing that I could come up with that I think is really helpful, especially when you're so overwhelmed all the time. And again, I don't have children yet. So I, I think that'll be a whole nother, I know that will be a whole nother challenge. But right now, you know, I'm running a household with my beautiful girlfriend, Amelia. We have a dog and two cats. I have a 21 person team. Uh, I do eight, sometimes nine episodes per week on the podcast. 
I'm going on other podcasts. I have 21 team members and 20 clients, so I'm I'm leading 41 people directly, and that's not including the indirect through the community and social media. And it it really does get overwhelming really fast. The cool thing about the 21st century is you have all this opportunity. The the problem with the 21st century is you also have all these uh, <laughs> responsibilities and distractions constantly. And you know my WhatsApp and my we have an event coming up, so I'm just sending invites. And we, we it's just if you ever hosted a live event, it's just so much work. Mm. It's crazy how much work goes into these events. It's literally insane. Um, and it's humbling every year we've done, this is our sixth or seventh one in a row. Every year we do them team is flying in. It's just so humbling. But to answer your original question, like how do you balance it all? And to get back to the book, the art of focus, I'm trying to focus my mind and not get so overwhelmed all the time but also stay holistic and not neglect my relationship, not re- neglect my physique, uh, my fitness. And so the answer that I have for you is I think it comes down to what you measure. And I, I know that that sounds overly simplistic, but seriously, if you're not measuring the right things, you're not going to focus on the right things. And this might be unique to me because I'm a numbers guy, but I think what you measure is going to get your focus and what you focus on is going to dictate what you say and do. And what you say and do is going to dictate the outcomes that you get. And so what I'm always trying to do with my clients and with myself is I think I'm measuring the wrong thing. And I try to shift what I measure. And so, for example, the event is in nine days. Uh, A month and a half ago, I talked to my girlfriend. I said, sweetheart, the next month is kind of going to suck. And I just, I need your support. Please help. And I just need a little bit of grace when it comes to being a little less present. Now I'm still Mm -hmm. trying my best, but at the end of the day, I'm definitely less present. Uh, You mentioned when you were traveling and sort of neglecting your relationship that there, there is a reality that has to be acknowledged. Uh, And Emilia and I are also, I think I talked to you about this behind the scenes. We were coming up on, uh, we actually just surpassed now two years of consistent exercise in a row. Mm-hmm. And we haven't missed a day, 30 minutes of exercise a day. We decided to do this little thing. You know, I started out with four months and then we eventually did a year and then she's like, let's do this forever. And I had a mini panic attack. But anyways, so <laughs> now we did it one day at a time. Here we are where we have a yeah. streak of two years. So if you add that on top of everything I've already said, it's just how do you not crack like a walnut underneath all this pressure? And the answer I think comes down to measuring the right things and then harmonizing uh, your actions underneath those things that you're optimizing for. And you mentioned optimization earlier. And the truth is I never could achieve all of this if it wasn't for me constantly and consistently learning how to become more productive, efficient, and effective. And surrounding Mm -hmm. myself with people who are also kind of doing that, but they're also doing that because I'm doing that. And that's the lead by example thing. And that's what I do for a living. So keep in mind that I'm all day, every day, you know, coaching, podcasting, speaking, training, workshops, all about this topic. So it makes sense for me to be constantly tweaking and improving because people will say, how do you do that? I don't understand. Nine episodes a week. That's insane. It is. And I am a little crazy, so that's fair. But (laughs) I didn't start there. I didn't start there. When we first started the podcast, it was only one a week and then eventually two and eventually three. And and so you just kind of add, 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 and then you have to eliminate two. And so the two things I would say is, number one, you have to measure the right things. Hmm. And if you're measuring the right things, everything will harmonize under that. And then number two is not just measuring the right things. Oh, what was I saying before that? I've completely lost my train of thought. Number one was measuring the right things, harmonizing yeah. underneath that. What did I say right before harmonizing? The the um, growing slowly and improving slowly, I think, in terms of you didn't start with the eight episodes a week. You started with one and then you grew from there. Mm. Yeah, and you talked about surrounding yourself with with good people and leading by example. It'll come to me hopefully by the end of the episode, but it completely, I completely yeah. lost it. But number one is measuring the right things. And you have to have a measurement under health, wealth, and love. 
You have to have a measurement that's holistic. And so mm. you can't just measure one thing. There's a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And I, I, I think it's a great book. I really do. Uh, it's very valuable. But I think one is too few and I think five is too many. So I try really no. hard to keep my metrics down to three main things. So right now, my metrics are uh, ticket sales for the event. Hmm. We have a percent that is paid back on our last business loan. So that's a percentage. I think it's at 54.8% right now. And then gross revenue. So those are my three metrics right now. Now, all three of those are business. Hmm. So if if I don't shift in Q2, my relationship is probably in trouble. So, but I also knew that right now the business needs more of my attention, more of my intentional energy than my health and my uh, relationship does right now because I'm just coming out of a chapter where I was focused on that. And so I think that that's really the last piece I'll share is the idea of entropy. Entropy states, it's a uh, physical law that all things dissolve into chaos. So in other words, if you don't take care of your home and renovate it and, and clean it, it will go to go to crap. That's the case with every business, with every relationship, with every body. Everything decays or builds. Yeah. Everything yeah. grows or dies. That's that's just the law of the universe. And so the question becomes, where is your intentional energy going? And how do you consistently measure the things? Whatever you measure is where your intentional energy will go. And mm -hmm. if you don't shift the measurement, you can't expect to shift the outcome. Um, and yeah. hopefully you're not measuring only three things in business. Like I am, you gotta, <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's, um, such fantastic advice. And I know from my own personal journey in fitness where, I mean, I've, I'm a tech geek as well. So, um, I've embraced all these tools where you can log your fitness log, like Strava, log my bike rides. And then I, I check my effort nice. score each ride and I check my average speed and I check the output watts that I give and I get really excited. I always come back to my wife and I said, wow, I, my effort score was less than the last time and my average speed was higher at the same time and my power output was higher at the same time. So I know I'm putting in less effort, generating more power and going faster, which is nice. all in all it's good right it's it's sort of a measurement Means you're improving in some ways it's a it's a bit of a game um but looking at that and i kind of looked at at that and i've i've been doing that with my tracking my weight and my lean body mass um because i'm at the moment i've i've lost a lot of weight over the last um well actually a year ago i lost a lot of weight because i was uh, getting a bit um flabby around the middle so i worked on that and um now I'm at a point where I need to build up more muscle mass because I, I want to actually be stronger for a longer time. So tracking that with some technology, um, as you say, that really makes it very clear for me where am I on the journey and I'm, I know I'm focused on that and I, I can see, okay, what's what I'm doing right now is working, so just keep doing that. Um, if something doesn't work, I figure out what do I need to tweak. The other one um, in business, um, I do uh, have lots of targets there and I'm tracking those and that's pretty easy. I guess the one that I'm, I'm curious about is what are the measures you put in place for relationships? I mean, I've got lots of relationships. I've got a 96-year-old dad who still lives on his own and, you know, I, I don't know how long he's going to be with us, but one of the key things for me there is just being there for him and spending time with him and of course helping out in the things he needs help with i've got um a daughter who's close by who i love spending time with we go bike riding together and of course i've got my partner who you know we live together and that's the most important relationship um how do I, how do you take those things and put a measure around that yeah so that is so such a good question Emilia and I coach couples and we have been doing this for three years now. And we've noticed that, so we have something called the 25 conscious love languages. So if you've ever heard of the book mm -hmm. by Gary Chapman of the yeah. five love languages, yeah. so we complicated the hell out of it. No, All we right. <laughs> created 25 conscious love languages because there's a lot more than five. There really is. Fitness, yeah, for yeah. example, 
is a love language. Okay. So mm. supporting your fitness goals, if your wife were to support your fitness goals, mm. that would be something that would make you feel loved most likely. Yeah. And, and so what we do with these couples, we sit them down and they go through this sheet where they rate from zero to 10, the level of importance for each of these 25 love languages. So one of them is supporting my goals and aspirations. One of them is fitness. One of them is uh, adventures. One of them is sexual intimacy, all these different ones. And what you find is there's couples that are missing each other. In other words, there's mismatches. So it seems hmm. like you're quite the numbers thinker. You were a nerd like me, math and science geek a little bit, right? Yeah. So, okay. Yep. So imagine you have a, a 10 and a two, rot row. Hmm. If you have a level 10, so for me in my past relationship, fitness was a 10 out of 10 for me. And for the other person, it wasn't. Hmm. Career and goals and supporting my goals was a 10 for me. And for her, it was a two. And so we were missing each other. We were very incompatible in that sense. Now, the idea isn't you're going to get all the same ratings. You're not going to have all 10s mm. that are 10s and all that. Everyone has some mismatches. The key is to be aware of it. So you asked, what do you measure? First and foremost, you have to ask the question of what is the most important thing to my partner? We call them cup fillers. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so of all the love languages, combine them into the top three. What are the three most important love languages to your partner? So those are called the top three cup fillers. That's what Emilia and I call it. For her, there's three things. Uh, one is adventures, outdoor adventures. They mm -hmm. have to be outdoors. So tonight, we're going on a walk tonight. And it's actually yeah. nice out, which is big for us because it's been cold. Uh, and I was, she could tell because earlier I was talking to her and uh, I was like, are we going for a walk tonight? And she could tell what I wanted to do was go to the gym. Mm -hmm. I want to weight train because I'm feeling, I was feeling good earlier. And, uh, She's like, don't take that away from me. She was playful. She's like, no, no, we're going on a walk tonight. And it's that. So number one is outdoor adventures. It has to be outdoor. Number two is whiteboard learning. So we call it STEM BIF. We're kind of geeky, her and I. So science, <laughs> technology, engineering, mathematics, business, and finance. Yeah. She wants to learn everything from my brain. She wants me to sit in front of a whiteboard. She's like a kid in a candy store. She loves, we have a whiteboard downstairs. It's the centerpiece of our home. And on the weekends, she just wants to take notes and learn everything I know. It's awesome. It's awesome. She's also seven years younger. So, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there. She's mm -hmm. way ahead of me in emotional maturity, but when it comes to science, technology, engineering, mathematics, business, and finance, I'm definitely ahead. So that's number two. And then the other one, what is the other one? I should know this off the top of my head, hundred percent, but I'm also having trouble. I'm a little bit of brain fog today. Outdoor adventures. Oh, physical care, physical care. So foot rub massage, anything, uh, head massage. We have this, these little head scratcher things that we use <laughs> anything that shows her physical care. So it's not just physical touch. It's physical care. It needs to be intentional, yeah. physical, present care. And so those are the three big ones. If those three big ones are happening and they're happening consistently. And by the way, I do measure them. So I have a spreadsheet <laughs> with them and I try, I check in on them. I try to do it yeah, weekly. Yeah. I try to do it weekly, but, um, and I call it a love score. I have a love score, but that's the thing. So you got to ask yourself the question, what's the one, two, or three most important things to my partner, where if those things are happening consistently, that takes care of 80% of, of, uh, the fulfillment in the relationship. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I'd love to learn more about the 25 love languages, <laughs> sort of. I will send, we have a PDF I can send you. Yeah. Excellent. Great. We have a PDF. Um, yeah. We've yeah, curated I, it over many years. So it's, it's quite good. Yeah. 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 I'm fascinated because um, I've, I've been delving into the, the idea of the love languages. And as you say, there's kind of three that, that are commonly talked about, but um, breaking it down to that level. And, and it's kind of like, determining values within an intimate relationship, isn't it, for the individuals and then looking for values alignments there and how can I meet my partner's values in a way that that is sincere and genuine and at the same time provides her fulfilment in a way that, that ultimately fulfills me as well. Yeah, well, two partners that are fulfilled, they're just going to handle everything better. Hmm. Whereas two partners that are both stressed, both not meeting their own needs or each other's, 
it's it life is going to crumble you and you're going to grow apart and uh most couples including me in the past were mismatched in so many of those love languages and it's okay to be mismatched but what's not okay is to be mismatched and not know it i hmm. i used to put massive time and effort into things that didn't matter to my partner hmm. And I would yeah, wonder, what, what is the deal? I don't. Why yeah. is why is there no good reaction happening here? And you become resentful. Yeah. I'm spending all this time doing all this stuff for you, and you're not appreciative. Yeah. Exactly, and that that builds resentment, which is one of the hmm. the four horsemen of relationships that John Gottman talks about in his research. But I can send the PDF to you. It's a, it's got the 25 conscious love languages and it's got two columns, partner one and co- partner two. And you can sit down with your wife and you can do zero to 10. <laughs> how important are each of these to you? Yeah. That there's all the cheat codes. You now there, you know, you've got 10, nine, eight, we've got to find the tens, nines and eights. Focus mm. on those. You don't have to worry about the twos yep. and threes. The others. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And is that okay if we share that with the listener? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. It's so a free we'll resource, that. totally free resource. Cool. Just, yeah. We'll have that in the show notes then. So one of the other things I did want to explore, I mean, the time's sort of moving on, but you mentioned, um, and you, you told me this beforehand as well, that you you have a 21 person team, you have 21 different departments and they're all remote. And I, if I understood it correctly, none of you have met in person other than on internet calls, Zoom calls or whatever. Um, how do you navigate the challenges of kind of maintaining alignment and motivation in that team and, and growing <clears throat> that team to sort of have, you know, the cultural focus that you want for the business? Well, the, the first thing to, uh, we, we have, so some of the team I've never met but we have a live event every year. And so I have met some of right. the team, but okay. we don't have an office right. building that we all go to, to your point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no like headquarters that everybody gathers at to, to work. So it's a completely virtual team, but we have met in person at live events. So in nine days, actually we have an Airbnb for the whole weekend with the team. It's kind of like a okay. yeah, yeah. sort of it's... team retreat in tandem with a live event for our community. Hmm. So that's actually pretty cool. But that's only once a year. And so Mm. you have to build these in-person relationships once a year and then you kind of go off and then you're virtual for the whole rest of the year. And then I have one team member, for example, Laura, she's in Spain and I've actually never met her in person. Mm. And then I have another team member, her name name is Ron. I'm actually on with her right after this. So in 18 minutes, I'm going to be on with Ron. She's in the Philippines, so it's going to be morning for her. She's 12 hours Mm. ahead of me. So it'll be 7 p.m. for me. It'll be 7 a.m. for her. And we've been working together for four years. And she, the reason I know that is because she, her NLU birthday was uh, announced in one of the WhatsApp groups that we have. So yeah, no. to answer that question, it's definitely the most challenging thing in the entire world, first of all. Uh, the three things that I'm most focused on in life is number one is business, number two is leadership, and number three is effective communication. And all of those are very connected, obviously. Hmm. But... uh how are we doing that? So how do you, and that's the question, how do you harmonize 21 individuals and how do you create a culture where you're harmonizing 21 individuals in an organized way with the infrastructure of the business model toward common goals while everyone is growing and fulfilled in the direction of their dreams? How do you align the the organization's goals and dreams with the goals and dreams of the individuals within it. That is the question. That's the question that you live and breathe every day. And what's a good example of this rather than some esoteric fortune cookie sayings. Okay. I'll give you an example. So I'm on with Ron later tonight. I'm going to come into that meeting. So I coach everybody. We do biweekly coaching. And so the first Mm -hmm. thing is you have to have a runway for the plane to take off. And the runway is, uh, okay, so every other week we do a team huddle. It's an hour and a half. The first half an hour is we connect. We all share our personal most important win for the week and most important improvement uh, for the bi-week. Mm-hmm. Then we have metrics. 
And the metrics are, we call it a GIP score, growth impact and profitability score. And it's every department from zero to 10, how well we're doing. And then what are we winning at? Most important win, what's the most important improvement? And so that's the chance for us to go through as a team where we're winning and where we need to improve every every other week. Now, the key is there's department meetings in between each of those meetings. So mm-hmm. for example, book club is one of the departments at NLU. We have a book club. We do it every week. Brandon is the director of book club. So Brandon is responsible for book club and I'm responsible for coaching Brandon. So we have a department meeting every other week, which is in between team huddles where we yeah. go through the metrics and each department has its own metrics. And then at the end of that department meeting, we have the metrics updated and we have a most important win, most important improvement. And then that goes into the main dashboard that we go over as a team. Hmm. So hopefully I'm explaining this well, cause it's actually fairly yeah, complex, yeah. but then we have a full hour and a half, the first half hour we connect. And then we have a whole hour to go through every single department And then every director gets a chance to share their most important win, most important improvement that was done on the department meeting. But now everyone else says, okay, and that's where you sort of cross pollinate Mm. ideas. Cross pollinate, yeah. Exactly. And so now everything Mm. that seems siloed becomes not siloed anymore. Now, the key underneath that is that every department has its own internal WhatsApp group. And every department has its own internal team that's in that WhatsApp group. Mm Mm-hmm. And so everything that has to do with that department gets done through that WhatsApp group. Mm. So we don't have some really crazy esoteric project management tool running everyone. We have a WhatsApp group that everyone on that team is in, involved in that department. And then I'm tracking metrics by doing these department meetings with every department head every other week. And then we all have a team huddle together where we're all connecting. Now, the other piece is it can't all be work and no play. So we have something called the Out Here Jeffing Club. The Out Here Jeffing Club is a funny pun uh, that's actually going to be really hard to explain. But it's it's a it's kind of like the Breakfast Club type of thing. It's the one place at NLU where no one's allowed to uh, be. Uh, focused on work it's it's where you send funny videos you 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 send Mm. pictures of your animals your pets and then every other friday we have a half an hour where we host like a pictionary like a virtual pictionary or (laughs) uh, we did one for halloween where it was halloween trivia and and someone is in charge of making the next out here jeff and club meeting extra special we also did a movie game once i i hosted that one um and then we did like the spin questions there's like a wheel of questions that you do with everybody it's it's a way to connect and get to know each other and so i coach everyone bi-weekly we have a team huddle bi-weekly we have department meetings bi-weekly we have whatsapp which is our main form of communication between each other and then we also have uh out here jeff and sort of personal not professional aspect of the of the team and and that has worked really well but the key is you have to be consistent with it and you have to hold people accountable to it and it does. It it gets everyone kind of rowing in the same direction. And whenever they're not, they kind of, you, you know, you check in. So I have one team member. Her mm-hmm. name's Riley. And I checked in with her recently because she's having a hard time. And she's been a little MIA lately. And it wasn't a guilt or shame thing. It was, hey, we're still here. We're hoping you're doing well. And let us know when you're available. And she said, hey, I just have to change the time. And so we're going to reconnect. But at the end of the day, it, it is messy naturally to lead a team, but if you have the right structure in place, and we used to do weekly, by the way, which was too much, but mm. monthly was too long. So you have to find yeah. the sweet spot. And so, so far, bi weekly has been really, really beneficial. It's a month mm. feels like you're too disconnected. Yeah. And a week, it's just drinking from the fire hose. It's like, hey, what's new? Nothing. Too, I haven't yeah. had a chance to yeah. do my work yet. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, there's a lot of, communication that goes on in between and lots of different kind of channels that you use um, both from a technology standpoint and also the the sort of expectations of how people communicate and the fun that you have um, as part of the whole process. Uh, love it. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, um, uh, this is fantastic. I could sort of go on digging into your experiences for ages but as we know you're you've got a 
a coaching call coming up, so we don't want to delay that too much. So I think it's a good time to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. That's the same five questions I ask of every guest. And the idea is you'll give us a snappy, insightful answer that will inspire our listener to do something awesome as a result. Nice. Okay. I'm not good at short answers. I'll try my best. <laughs> All right. What's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, think about your thinking. Hmm. I'll let you elaborate a little bit more on that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm reading a book right now called Thinking About Your Thinking. It's actually a fairly garbage book, but but the idea of meta thinking is really important. In other words, uh, how what what are the questions you're asking yourself constantly? Because thinking is is asking and answering questions, and our brains are always optimizing for something. I talked about what you measure. So what you hmm. measure is what your brain's going to optimize for. And wh when I your subconscious and unconscious brain is much more powerful than your conscious. So everything you're thinking about at night in your dreams, 24, 7, 365 is all kind of optimizing. So you get these answers, these insights mm -hmm. and the insights come from your brain chewing on the right stuff. And so if you can think about your thinking and try to ask yourself what questions you're asking yourself consistently. So for example, um, one of the questions that I ask myself often is, What's the most valuable use of my time right now? Now, here's yeah. the thing. The answer to that question is predicated on the goal. That's mm. the thing. I can give advice, but it's not relevant always. The questions are, what's the most valuable yeah. use of my time right now? That's going to change from moment to moment, yeah. from day to day. Mm. If something was wrong with Emilia right now, I would. the most valuable use of my time would be to leave this mm. podcast and go take care of her. Mm. Okay? So, but... That's why I think thinking about your thinking and thinking about the questions you're asking yourself is super, super important. Mm. Yeah, I love it. And I love the clarification as well. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Uh, so I have this journal. It's a dream liner. <laughs> we, we just yeah. came out with it. It's on Amazon. And it's achieve your dreams 90 days at a time. And, and the, the idea underneath it is taking your big dreams and breaking them down into goals, which are annual, and then breaking those down into quarters. So divide those by four and then breaking those down into inch pebbles, which are daily habits. Mm. And so the idea is you're climbing a mountain and there's like a mountain on the front of it yeah. and your dreams are at the top of the mountain and you can take, you know, your 10 year goals, break them down into one year goals, one year goals, break them down into quarterly milestones and then break those milestones down into inch pebbles. But to answer your original question, it's the journal. I, I, mm. I wanted a journal that wasn't so in-depth that I couldn't do it every day. And so yeah. I've woke on, woken up every single day in 2024 and I've, I've journaled. Okay. And so that's how I'm coming up with better ideas. Okay. I'm going to have to have a look at that because I keep thinking journaling is so valuable, but I can never consistently do it because I often sit down and what am I going to write today? And I'll just take, take my pen because I love my fountain pens and I'll just write down you know, this pen is empty or something like that. And that's, that's about the best I can come up with. <laughs> so I'll have to check that. The Dreamliner is designed against that. The Dreamliner, <laughs> it has, it has just, it's in the sweet spot of yeah. one of our listeners called it boring. Uh, I understand why, cause it is, it's redundant, but top three gratitudes, top three tasks for the day. What's your most important improvement? What's your most important win? And it's simple, simple, simple. And then there's one page for notes. So the, the left page is is sort of train tracks that keep you on the rails. And then the right page is is free form. And it's mm -hmm. it's very simple. It only takes me 10 minutes a day. So that's that's yeah. the idea. Excellent. Yeah. And it sort of comes back to your philosophy of the uh, measuring everything, doesn't it? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you might have already answered this one then. What's the f favorite resource you use most often? Sounds like it might be your um, <laughs> I'll, I'll use something different than that. Yeah, My yeah. favorite resource I use most often, Audible. I use mm. Audible constantly. It is such a great platform and I love listening to books. I do. I, I listen to books pretty much every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tremendous yeah, it's resource and it's 15 it's bucks a month isn't and it, it? it just, yeah. yeah, it's so good. It's, it's so good. Yeah. So, yeah. And particularly, particularly, I, I suspect you're like me because you're in the podcasting game that, um, you know, listening to an audio book is just something natural. Uh, 
and yes. and it's so easy to do because I often when I'm going for a walk, if I'm on my own, I will listen to an audio book. Same, same. Yeah. We do a half hour a day, like I said, and sometimes I do walk alone if if Emilia and I are in different sort of schedules. I don't want to. I love audiobooks. I love audiobooks. As a matter of fact, I started a podcast called The Next Level Audio Blog because <laughs> I have a blog on my LinkedIn that is written, but yeah. for the people who don't, who want to be able to do dishes and walk and do the laundry and do stuff around the house while they listen, I actually record them now. So I, I record me reading them. So it's called The Next mm. Level Audio Blog. And so there's two episodes now. I'm still catching up to my LinkedIn because I have 15 blogs now. Um, and they're all how to's on success, but hmm. I, I'm in love with listening to content because you can do things and be productive while doing it. Yep. Mundane things that are normally boring, like mobility, stretching, walking, foam rolling, hmm. dishes, laundry, cleaning the house, whatever it is you can listen. And so it's, hmm. it's a really, really good way to just download good ideas into your hmm. consciousness. Love it. All right, and you might have answered this one already as well. What's the best way to keep a project on track or a client on track? Yeah, what you measure. Hmm. Um, client on track, I'll answer that. So we have something called peak performance tracking. It's it's a simple habit tracker on Google Sheets. We also have an app called Optimal that keeps the habits on track. I was on with a client earlier. Her name is Brenda. She's from New Zealand. She's awesome. She has her own business. She does home staging. And I told her, I said, so she, she had a big month, really big month. It was awesome. And I, I, I was very candid with her. And again, I have a good relationship with her, so don't take this the wrong way. But I basically <laughs> said, I can't stand when there's missing data. I, I think I said, I can't effing stand it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she's like, I know, I know. I just, you've got to track. I'm not going to coach you if you're not going to track. I need data. I can't, I can't guide you without any data. And so... I do a report every other week before every call and I look at how they've been doing for the previous week, uh, previous two weeks. So I do weekly, bi-weekly and monthly. But I always look up when our last call was and I look at their spreadsheet and I run a report and I see, okay, here's where they're winning and here's where they're not. And so I can go into the call informed with what needs to tweak. Now, the cool part of this is not only do they get better at the system, aka at tracking and executing mm -hmm. against their system, their daily habits, but we also improve the system. Yeah. So imagine you have 10 habits, let's just say, 10 habits that you do a day. It's a lot, but let's say you do. 20 minutes listening to Audible and, and you know, 60 ounces of water and uh, journaling before bed, whatever, okay? We have something called TPO, total productive output. Let's say you get 60%, then 65%, then 70%, then 65%, then, then 75 I run a report, you averaged, let's say, 70%. 70% average. Okay. Over time, you're going to get more and more and more capable. So you can see the graph. It tr mm. The trend line is up. It, yeah. It's up and down and up and down and up and down. But over time, the trend line is up. Mm. Now, we get on the phone and we improve the system. So we, I, I always say this. Before we go and my clients hate this question because I will not not ask it, which is <laughs> before we go, we have to improve this system by at least 1%. If you had to improve your peak performance tracker by at least 1% before we leave this call, what would you change? You can get rid of something, you can add something, or you can shift something, but we're not leaving this effing call <laughs> until something improves. And here's yeah. the cool part. Now you're compounding the compounding. Hmm. Now you're improving the execution and improving the system. Yeah. So now you're improving the improvements and that's when things just get wild and it's just awesome. Mm. I mean, I started out as a podcaster doing one episode a week and now here I am, right? 21 person <laughs> team, blah, blah, blah. How did you do it? It was the simple compounding of small improvements every day over nine years. And trust me, before that, I was not improving nearly to the extent I am now. And that's the best tool in the world is tracking. There is no more mm -hmm. powerful tool on planet Earth than tracking. I don't care if you do it physical journal or in Google Sheets or you do it on an app. You, you, if you track, you will stay on track. It, what you measure will manage your entire life. And mm -hmm. it's so, so, so important. And it's, that's why it's so overlooked. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think we've 
kind of covered that a lot in in the conversation today and there were a lot of excellent ideas there as well i, I think the improving the process and it sets up the philosophy or the, the culture almost of there's continuous improvement in all of this so it's not just about my business it's about you know how do we improve the way we're measuring this how do, so it's a kind of like pervades everything right well you can't imagine an olympic athlete who doesn't track their metrics you, you hmm. know every discipline I, I was on with the business owner earlier brenda and we tracked her gross revenue and she had a big month how do we even know she's doing well hmm the only way you know is if you track things. Where we get confused is we either track too many things or too few things, or we track yeah, the wrong the things. Wrong things. Yeah. Wrong things. Mm. And what are the right things? That's a whole other podcast episode in and of itself. <laughs> but I recommend a book called Measure What Matters. Uh, that's a mm. it's it's a really good book. Yeah, and and I think that's about the third or fourth book you've mentioned. So we'll make sure we link to all those books as well. Excellent. Well, final question of the buzz round. What's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Improve yourself. Uh, and and as fortune cookie as it sounds, be yourself. Improve your unique self. Hmm. There's a big difference between I'm not accepting who I am, so I'm going to go try to change it. That's not what I'm saying to do. Hmm. What I would much rather you do is say, you know what? I am naturally intelligent and also I have this proclivity towards overconfidence. So I'm going to work on being less arrogant and I'm going to, and I'm going to work on being more hardworking and not just smart. There's a lot of self-awareness in that. And mm -hmm. so be yourself, your unique self, but improve that version of you. I'd much rather you say, I accept who I am for who I am and grow from that yeah, and improve from that. Then, Hey, I want to go be like this other person who, yeah. We, I, think I think that's where we all start. That's where I started. I wanted yeah, to be yeah. like other people. And yeah, and, and eventually you realize the, that's a mistake. You can't. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the danger in today's world, isn't it? We sort of see somebody say, wow, they're really successful and um, I'd like to be as successful as they are. So I'll be like them, um, which usually fails. And um, it's much better to have the self-awareness and say, well, these are my strengths. This is my personality this is my cultural background these are my values i'm going to be true to those but what can i improve or where can i grow hmm. love it and what comes natural to you is is something that you probably undervalue hmm. because Absolutely. it comes naturally yeah and just take a look at that self-awareness is so important when it comes to self-improvement hmm all right. Well, this has been fantastic, Alan. Thanks. And where can people find out more about you and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? If you do want to reach out, I really appreciate it. Alan, A-L-A-N, at nextleveluniverse.com. That's the website, nextleveluniverse.com, spelt all just like it sounds. The podcast is different than that. It's Next Level University. So Next Level University and nextleveluniverse.com. So the podcast is Next Level University. The website is nextleveluniverse.com. The person who has nextleveluniversity.com is asking for way too much money. If you do email me, uh, please just provide context because like all of us, I get a lot of spam mm. mail. And you can check out the podcast. I have a blog on my LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, Alan Lazarus, A-L-A-N-L-A-Z-A-R-O-S. You can Google me. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, those are the, the three that I use and uh, I hope to connect. If anything touched you, please, please reach out. I would love to connect. I'm uh, happy to help any way I can. Excellent. All right. And we'll, of course, have all those links in the show notes as always. So finally, Alan, um, what action would you like our listener to take as a result of our conversation today? Uh, what action would I want you to take? Yeah, I would say, look, ask yourself a simple question, which is what is one toxic person, place, thing, or idea that I need to sail away from? Mm. And have the one. courage, have the courage to actually do that. Sail away, yeah. just just goodbye. It's done, it's over. Maybe it's alcohol, mm. maybe it's, maybe it's a, a toxic friend. Uh, just find one thing 
person, place, thing, or idea that that you're going to sail away from and not look back. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, and and of course that frees up to focus on something better. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks 100%. so much for sharing your time and insights with us so generously today, Alan. This has been a fascinating conversation. We could have talked for a lot longer, but we will leave some for the listener to go and discover themselves, and we'll have links to all the all the websites you referred us to and also the um, books that you mentioned as well. And uh, all the best for the future, and please do stay in touch. You as well. Thank you so much. This was a breath of fresh air. This was an honour. And the work you're doing is making a difference. For anyone who listened to this, I I do believe that they got some value that will change their future. And I think that's what matters. So thank you so much for what you do. I really appreciate it. It was genuinely an honor. Thank you. Thank you.